everyone, we are Geeks Not Nerds. I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Brandon. And today Brandon's filling in for Vince. Brandon, thanks for being here with me. No problem, always a pleasure. Yeah, it's exciting. Today we're going to be talking about the importance of visual detail in film. Uh, today we're going to be discussing the phenomenon of discovering a really cool, interesting, or important, or just nifty uh, thing that pops out at you of a film that you've seen a bunch of times and you never noticed it before. That's right. And we thought of this topic because of something that actually happened to us, an experience that we had while we were making the uh, Back to the Future 2 commentary uh, that just was posted last week. And if you missed that, uh, Brandon's going to tell you about what happened. Brandon? Okay, we're going through and we're watching the movie and it gets about, I believe it's about halfway through the movie. And they're back in 1955, but it's the altered... Uh, Excuse me. No, they're back in 1985. It is the altered 1985 because of the almanac that was given to young Biff by old Biff in 1955. That what happened was Biff decided to build his uh, Biff Towers casino and resort in Hill Valley. It had never made sense to me what that building exactly represented because I'd missed a key detail on the wide shot of that building. Would you explain what that uh, detail was? The fact that it's the clock tower. That's right. It is the clock tower. And I never noticed it before either, uh, but I caught it there. And I said, oh, hey, guys, it's the clock tower. And it was nobody a huge else, revelation. None of us had ever caught it before. That's right. Uh, Tim, Tim Lyons didn't notice it. I'm not sure Gloria noticed it before. I, I'm not I, sure I, don't, I don't think she weighed in on it, I, so I don't, I don't remember. But, I mean, like, like Tim was kind of floored, too. He's like, oh, wait a minute, it is the clock tower. It was totally the clock tower. I had no... I did, I had never seen. I've seen that in you know in a on a big screen. I've seen it on a tiny screen. I've You've watched probably seen it, it fifty times. I've yeah. seen it I, a lot. One, I love that series, the, that trilogy of movies. And I think that that's one of the greatest <clears throat> things about all three of the Back to the Future films is all of these really cool details, a lot of the continuity stuff. Yes. Um, that it, a lot of what's fun about it is that it makes you, it it. it, it it makes you think. First of all, there's reasons to keep rewatching movies. There is, and and I think that that's one of the most fun things about rewatching films. I think it's one of the reasons we, we do rewatch movies. Um, I think it's one of the reasons that we reread books and things like that too. Yeah, uh -huh. And also, uh, sometimes in a case like that, it might make some plot thing make more sense. It it made the whole Biff Towers make more sense to me on a just on a fundamental level. Uh, there was another I, I was, thing in that movie that I noticed that I'd never caught before. What's that? Either that, that you that you did know about um, that was uh, that the the uh, number on the console on the the uh, time thing on the dashboard flashes up eighteen eighty five at one point um, before Doc Brown gets sent back there. That's and right. That, and that uh, that shows you forethought. It's that, forethought that and foreshadowing. It was in foreshadowing. Yeah, that it was that it was already there, uh, and that's kind of neat. Now it's maybe a little bit convenient that we had a mention of Biff Tannen. I mean, I, I'm sorry, a mention of um, his his um, his ancestor. But nobody in ever said you. Film. But nobody ever said you couldn't have multiple foreshadowing events. No, that's true. That no, no, is true. yet sure. another foreshadowing event. But that's kind of fun. And, and yeah. in the original Back to the Future, um, not to just stay on Back to the Future. There's other things we'll talk about. Yeah. Um, that there's there's that um, there's there's the Lone Pine versus Twin Pine Mole thing. Yes. I never I never caught that before. Um, like like two or three times ago when I saw when I saw it. And I went, man oh, that's Peabody. pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and he goes and um, you, you know, Marty McFly runs over his pine and goes, my pine! And yeah, then, but in, in the very beginning, Doc Brown introduces old man Peabody by saying he had some crazy idea about breeding pine breeding trees. Breeding pine trees. And I didn't catch that line before. I didn't realize that the, the mall was called that because of that. And then the name of the mall changes at the end because there's only one pine tree. And anyway, all that stuff. Um, I, Zemeckis and Gale are geniuses at this They're stuff. They're really good. And also, um, <clears throat> I mean, some of their other movies are... Roger, Roger Rabbit is filled with that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's been, it's been forever since I've seen it. But I will say one more thing about Back to the Future. One sure. thing that I hadn't realized until watching until after we watched the second one and did the commentary on it yeah. was another setup was that all the the next instances of the of the uh, bulletproof vest yeah sure they all actually originated 
from in, the in first two. movie. Oh, from the first movie. He's wearing a bulletproof vest. Of course, yeah. Of course. It had right. never occurred to me until about a week ago I thought about it again. I never thought about that either. Because I was always I was assuming... the setup was just that movie. I thought the setup was movie number two, right. where they show the bulletproof vest in the... Uh, in the John Wayne film. It's not John Wayne. No, it's, it's not. Eastwood. It's Clint, in the Clint Eastwood film, right. And, of course, Clint Eastwood is how he set up his... In, in uh, movie number three, which we'll, he, we will get to. When, when, when he's wearing sneakers and the goofy pink vest. He is, and why uh, we'll get to it, Eastwood Ravine, which is another great thing. Do you, so so let me ask you this question um, yes. to, to kind of um, uh, bring this to uh, a, a boil here for our conversation. Yes. Do you, do you find yourself, um, like... Like thinking specifically about this sort of thing when you rewatch movies, like like like, yes. do, do you do you find yourself consciously going, I'm picking movies to watch over and over again because I think I might see something I never saw before, or is it something that that simply ends up being a pattern in the movies that you find rewatchable? Well, there's uh, both. As a matter of fact, I'll give you an example. Okay. Uh, Minority Report. Oh yeah. I, I knew when I saw Minority Report that it was chock full of this type of thing it had to be and there was no way I was going to see everything the first time reminds me a little bit of Demolition Man that movie's got that I haven't seen that in a long time I've only seen it once oh watch it again I need to see it again you'll catch stuff yeah so what what I'll do is we'll order Taco Bell and then we'll watch Demolition Man (laughs) that sounds good Um, when I I watched uh, Minority Report and even iRobot second times not focusing on the main story Mm mm-hmm so that I could try to look around and see different things. I I need to come up with an example from each of those movies. I'm I find it hard pressed under this oh, no, the spotlight. Right. Yeah. But uh, I did that on purpose to see what I would find within these kind of subplots or stuff that was just placed there subconsciously or subvisually. You'll find a lot of product placement that way. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, and product placement is fun. You know, people complain placement. about product placement, and sometimes it can get in the way, it can get annoying. It's irritating in Fantastic Four, but... Drink um, this. Some, yeah, but sometimes it is kind of fun to, to notice it, and you go, oh, wow, that's not just a that, um, that's not just a drink. That's this that's this kind of soda, or, yeah. or you know, that's this kind of pizza, or whatever. Um, I was going to say, I think it's very interesting the kinds of things that we that, that, that our that our minds naturally tend to focus on mm-hmm. depending on who we are individually uh, when, when we watch film or again when we read books any any kind of media that we consume because yes. the human mind is not good at multitasking we're, True. we're not good at multitasking mm-hmm. we would try to be you know we all do it all the time That's uh, right. but, but we're not but, but just just as a species we're not good at it and so um, you and I will each find different sorts of things to focus on because right. we're different people. Um, I'm a story guy. I studied story. It's what I do. It's what I love. It's what I critique. And so I'm going to focus on most films a lot harder on character stuff. On, you are, on I'm going to focus harder on thematic stuff. I'm going to I'm, I'm going to try to look for subtext. I'm going to figure out what is the movie about. What's it trying to do? Somebody else is um, going to going to look at films like say somebody that studied film. Um, somebody's going to look at at, uh, at films more from a visual standpoint what is this right. what is this movie um, doing visually how, how are the shots composited uh, that sort of thing and it is impossible on a first viewing to take all those sorts of things in and as it a is. critic I just want to say this really quick as a critic it's really it's really interesting because you'll you'll review a film uh-huh. and you'll try to talk about every aspect of it and then when you watch it again your opinion is liable to change especially if it's a good film. Yes, and you'll realize that you've missed a lot. Mm-hmm. Like me, when I'm watching a movie, I'll notice little things like here and there. Not necessarily how a shot is composed, but something that they put in the shot that might, you know, take it further down the line. Uh, another really good example is Back to the Future again. In that opening shot of the clocks, they have a little figure hanging off of one of the arms of the clock that just that emulates what happens to Doc Brown at the very end. I don't know if you've ever seen that Never either. Thought of it. That's, in the, that's in the opening shot, and that's they're shooting brilliant. all the clocks. You'll see a little guy hanging onto one of them. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's good that's, stuff. That's really neat. Um, you know, and, and we look for this kind of stuff, and I think that it's it's a lot. Of, like I said, it's a lot of why good movies are rewatchable. That's I right. think that there are even not so good movies that still have this. Where, you know, where maybe the story's not that great, but it's still kind of fun to watch it again because you catch those kinds of things. You catch those um, kind of things. You know, but you know Batman '89, one of my favorite films to watch, um, uh-huh. it, it falls apart in the third act. I mean, that movie's got got problems, but. 
so much care was taken in the detail of what's in the mm-hmm. uh, of what's in those scenes that you catch stuff every time you yeah. see it. You know, there, there's there's a lot of movies like that. I mean, I should go back and rewatch. I've I've seen all the Batman movies at least once, but it's been for years. I need to go back and rewatch them. Uh, another thing that I might add is not only will you catch things. But other people will catch things, and this is one of the reasons why I like uh, IMDB.com a lot. Because if you go down to the bottom of any movie page, it has trivia and uh, goofs. Right. And if you go down to the goofs and you can find continuity errors, it gives you a reason to go back and watch a movie. That maybe even a movie you didn't think was very good the first time, maybe had some sort of subtext you didn't even know about. Although, I, I, I prefer to kind of find that stuff myself, you know? I do too, but if I've watched a movie enough, I might go just find out what it was I missed if I'm not finding everything I want to find. I think that uh, these these great movies that do this, um, you you really can't appreciate them on only one viewing. That's true. Um, you will appreciate things about them. It's the thing that will compel you to watch it again. Um, and sometimes you have movies <clears throat> where... Uh, when you have like a really interesting um, kind of uh, giant plot twist at the end of the film, where it's kind of a mind freak, and you find uh-huh. out that the entire movie is different than you thought it was, something like like uh, Fight Club, you know, you know, movies like that. Um, sometimes uh, then you find out that there are all these details that you would never think to pay attention to. And then you find out what the point of the film was. And then when you watch it again, totally different ballgame. Whole new experience. Uh, Fight Club was that way for me. The Matrix, to a point, was like that. Uh-huh. I just reviewed Dark City. Dark City has that in spades. What a great movie. And if you, if you, if you go back and, and, and rewatch that, you know, it's like Metropolis. Well, it's also borrowing and stealing a lot from Metropolis. But, I mean, like, like, like these are movies that once you know what the point of them is uh-huh. and where they're going and you watch them again, you start you start figuring out all these extra layers of subtext visually and story Well, now, what, what happens in Dark City? Because I believe I've seen that. It sounds familiar, but I'm not... Dark, Dark City was Kiefer Sutherland, and uh, it's... Well, he plays a mad scientist, basically. And, Is he on um, that alien world that keeps changing? Yes. Okay, That's I have City. seen that. Yeah. Okay, uh, going back to uh, another movie that you mentioned. I'm proud of you for, for having seen that, by the way, because I, a, lot, a lot of people never <clears throat> even heard of it, and it should have been a much bigger movie I had than a was. friend. I had a friend who was really into, like, uh, not like indie movies, but subculture movies yeah. and things like that. Okay, and yeah. he showed it to me one time uh, some years ago. It was entirely eclipsed by The Matrix a year later, and uh, it's in a lot of ways a smarter film than that. But, but anyway, I just reviewed it, and that's why it's on my mind. But well, yeah. there's in the in the movie uh, when I finally saw Fight Club, I had heard so many things about Fight Club, but the main thing that I ever heard about Fight Club was the number one rule about Fight right. Club was you don't talk about Fight Club, and to that point. I really hadn't actually heard anything about Fight Club. And that's what's so... But that's one of the things that's brilliant about the movie. It is. Is that, is that if, if people take it seriously enough to actually use... I never thought of it like this. To actually use the movie's tagline as a way to think about the fact that other people haven't seen it and you shouldn't tell them what happened in it. Not only that, I but just thought of that, where it's like, yeah, 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 you shouldn't talk about Fight Club because if you talk about it, you will ruin the ending. But not only you that... you need to experience that ending. Not only that, people weren't... Act- I don't think people were actually thinking about it that way. They were just thinking... I don't like, think they were either. If you're telling somebody about Fight Club, you're going to tell them the number one rule about Fight Club is yeah, you don't talk about Fight Club. That, so when that's I all ta- you'll say. When I saw it about four years ago for the first time... I was completely blown away. I was too. And I was you know, completely um, blown I didn't away. like it the first time I saw it. I didn't care for it. Then I watched really? it, I, I had to watch it twice. I actually liked and it. And then I loved it. Yeah. Another movie yeah. another movie like that is The Sixth Sense. Yeah. Now now they'll get a load of this. Yeah. I saw That's kind of one of the obvious go-tos. Except that The Sixth Sense, I think, is an example of a movie that once you know what the ending is, it's kind of not worth watching again. I would agree with you. However, this is what happened to me with The Sixth Sense. I don't I, feel like it has that visual layeredness we're talking about. I, right, but so I, much. I saw it for the first time about the same time that I saw Fight Club. And in all the years, I have heard Bruce Willis joke after Bruce Willis joke after Bruce Willis joke. Sure. No one ever said this joke, Bruce Willis is already dead, is about The Sixth Sense. So I never. You never connect connected yeah. the two. I think it's amazing that you managed to get through. Uh, That's what I'm saying. Both of those movies without anybody ever telling you the end. That's what um, I'm saying. That yeah, was sure. that was so great for me because when I figured out that Bruce so the, Willis was the Sixth dead, Sense, I finally watched that. When, when when I finally watched it, I already knew the ending. And <laughs> um, the thing is, 
I, I'm saying this in hindsight because I kind of already knew it, uh-huh. but but about about 20 minutes, half an hour in, I was kind of thinking, yeah, I think I could have called that. I don't know. I mean, like, like I Fight Club, I never would have called it. I, um, I was starting to in the sixth sense, but the fact that it sure. had never been ruined for me yeah, that's, was that's amazing. Cool. amazing. It's, well, and, and the thing is, you know, Vince and I have talked about this. It messes with your per, with, with your perceptions when you have seen it, because yes. because because Vince is is, is, is uh, had movies spoiled for him that are great movies, but he can't appreciate them right because right. he didn't have the experience. He didn't, he didn't have, have the, have the experience. experience. Right. Um, but with with I, I wish we had Vince here to talk about this, um, because because Vince likes to talk about um, what is what is that um, found footage film that. Um, uh, paranormal Activity. Okay. Uh, Vince got to see Paranormal Activity before it was wide release. Really? He, he saw it because because remember that was a really that was a really underground movie. Well, I haven't seen it. I haven't either, but I but I know what it is. And uh-huh. and, and Paranormal Activity was a um was an, was kind of an underground movie mm-hmm. that um got like really hyped up when it first got released and just like like for whatever reason a bunch of people saw it made a really big deal out of it and then a couple weeks later it became a wide release mm-hmm. and then it was huge and now there's like yeah. four or five of them. Right. And, and, but the thing is, um, this is one of those few examples where it didn't get spoiled for Vince. Because he got to see it before the hype. Not even despoiling the ending or anything story wise, he just he got to see it before the hype. Mm-hmm. And so he came back going, Oh my god, this movie's amazing. Three weeks later, a bunch of people didn't like it anymore. Yeah. Because it got so hugely hyped up and stuff that it just wasn't a big deal anymore. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't the same thing happen to the Blair Witch Project? No, yeah, it did. Yeah. Except that um, to a to a lesser degree, because um, because Blair Witch was a giant phenomenon. Because even because the thing is, nobody thought Paranormal Activity was real. People thought Blair Witch was real. Uh-huh. So even when people saw it and they realized that oh, it yeah. did, that it hadn't actually happened, that that it really was a made up movie, but that you know you know they they had gotten people that weren't actually real actors and had kind of I think maybe duped some of them into thinking that it was real and, yeah. you know, and, and all that kind of stuff was going on um, it was still such a novelty because it was the first big found footage thing right you know it, it was and that, that was a big part of it uh, and paranormal activity was kind of a, was I think kind of an attempt at um, you, you know you know I'm um, trapping light, lightning in a bottle again except that um, it also nobody expected it to get popular so it at least got that first run that was really big you know so anyway um, indeed uh, I know I had since neither of us has seen that one. I can't really ask you the question, but I'm wondering if perhaps Paranormal Activity has some of the things that we were talking about before, where if you watch it a second time, there are little things you might see here and there. Maybe so. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've heard that so much of it is just about the uh, about the ambiance and atmosphere because it's supposed to be like security cameras that. It, really, I've heard that it's kind of boring. Um, mm. y- y- you know, you know, watching it more than once. So. So I don't know, but uh, but anyway, I don't know either. Um, but yeah, to, to to wrap this up a little bit, um, I I think that uh, after you have this experience enough times, you find yourself, or at least I do, kind of looking for it. You know, I have been kind of wanting to do this. You know, you know, you know. Maybe if I go back and watch this movie for the eighty seventh time, I've, I'll pick up something I never caught before. Here's something that happens to me: I'll go to a movie theater and I'll watch a movie, and then I'll be distracted by like, what's something that I could see that. I would maybe necessarily at another time see at a later date instead of the first time around, and then I get distracted from the storyline. Well, you know, a lot of that is because of distractions, because of what we're focusing on, like I, like I mentioned before. Because of what we're focusing on, and also because we're used to going back to look for things, so now we're looking for them the first time, so that sometimes when I see a movie for the second time, I'll notice something that was put right out there for me to see to begin with well, of course, that I sure. just missed. Well, I mean, it's kind of like magic and sort of the art of deception, right? I mean, it it, I mean, I mean, it really is, um, because that's part of what movie making is about: is uh-huh. putting a camera in a particular place, um, you, you know, you know, uh, showing, giving us a particular field of vision, and trying to to put our eyes in a place. What does the director want you to see right now? Is constantly manipulating our eyes, and mm-hmm. if we try to fight that, and if we put our eyes someplace else, we might catch something really neat that you wouldn't have caught otherwise. That's right. But you also might miss plot. They also might miss That's character. True. And they not only do this in movies, but they do it in print advertising as well. Oh, of course. There, there's sure. so much. I'll give you. I'll give you an example. When I was working at my last job, and we had uh, an industry magazine and even a, a local magazine that was industry and local about the area we live in. Um, I was looking through, and I found this ad. And the curious, I, I'm reading this ad, and it's about hardwood floors. And I didn't work in the hardwood floors area, but it was in the industry mag. And I look, I, I decide to stray from the words on the page. And I look at the side, and there's a window 
in the house in which they're talking about this. And in the window, there's a scene outside, and it's a narrow scene, but you see the back half of a fully nude jogger. In this print advertisement. In a print ad That's in a amazing. magazine that went citywide. And nobody and probably caught it. It's not just citywide, but it is about our city, but it goes elsewhere. But somebody put that in there as a draw. You wouldn't even notice it unless you'd like been looking for it. I just had this idea to, to look at the entire ad. Sure, yeah. You would flip through this and you'd just be flipping right past it. It was it was crazy. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these kinds of exercises are really good ways to work on your powers of observation, and it's true. You'll, you'll you'll catch things Worth in the mind. Yeah, and you'll catch things in all sorts of different avenues that you never would would before. And that's why um, I don't think that uh, you know watching film, watching television has to be a passive experience. No, it doesn't. Uh, I think that it should be an active experience. I think that, uh, that that's why you know Vince and I did that whole video about um, trying to debunk the idea of um, of uh, turn your brain off and enjoy this. Uh, you, you, you know, you know the idea that uh, even if something isn't working um, you know, perfectly well on, on a story level and things like that, there might yeah. be other things that you can grab onto, well, and that it, it's, it's, um, and that it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be a passive experience. Uh, you know, it's, not, it's not just about laying around on your Barca lounge or getting fat watching TV. Well, you, you, know? make, you make a good point, uh, the, and the point I think that you've made without actually saying it is uh, suspending your disbelief is different than uh, just passively watching. Because there's, a, it is, yeah, it, it's, yeah. It, it well, is. if if you just if you just passively watch something and you're not um, allowing yourself to think, then right. you're kind of giving your disbelief away in a way in a way before you've even yes. begun. Uh -huh. If that makes sense. Oh, you because are. it's a movie, it must make sense. Because what? someone made it, and I think people have this idea sometimes. And we're getting this is a totally different different ball game here. But, but I, I like where but, we're going. But I think well, and, 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 and we've. And we've got to finish up, but I, yes. but 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 I do think that um, that sometimes there's this idea that just because it's official, just because somebody got the money to make something and there are brand names on it, um, that that automatically makes it professional and done well. I think I think I think some people get it, get this in their heads because they're not thinking about it. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. um, they just go, oh well, this must be good. It's a movie. you know you know pe like, like like people who like everything and aren't critical of anything. Right. Be overly critical, but then that becomes kind of undercritical. You know what I'm saying? But that's a totally different video. It is a totally different video. But I will say this one last thing before sure. we go is on that note, something that we've discussed at length at time about just that phenomenon is the last Star Trek movie. Oh yeah, sure. it's a good movie, but that doesn't make it good Trek. Yeah, no, sure. Yeah, we've talked about that. Yeah, all right. Sounds good. Well, uh, everybody, thanks a lot for watching Geeks Not Nerds, and if you have any cool examples of stuff that you never caught before in a movie you saw 500 times, and then on the 501th time, there it was, leave those in the comments. I'd love to read them. And 501th. Also, 501th, 501st time. And uh, did you like that? <laughs> I did. I, I was hoping I could get that buy-in. Nobody would catch it until the second or third time they saw this video. And uh, if you have a topic you'd like us to talk about in a future video, leave that in the comments as well. Thanks as always for watching. Thank you for joining me, Brandon. No problem. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks again, everybody. I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Brandon. And we'll see you next time.